My name's Matt, but you can call me Absol. And I really like shiny hunting in Sword and Shield. The game's mechanics, sometimes intentional and sometimes not, add so much depth to what can happen in a shiny hunt. And I can genuinely see myself coming back to these games in particular for hunts for years to come. And I wanted to take on this badge quest to illustrate exactly why. In case you're not familiar, a badge quest is a classic shiny hunting tradition, where you play through a Pokemon game hunting for a shiny for every single badge. In the case of Sword and Shield, that's 8 shiny hunts for all 8 badges. Also, by my own personal preference, I'll be doing all 8 of these shiny hunts at the full odds. Mostly because that's just the way I get the biggest thrill out of it. A shiny Pokemon is still a shiny Pokemon at the end of the day, so don't let that make you think that shinies obtained at boosted odds are worth anything less or anything like that. Beauty's in the eye of the beholder. And to some, shiny hunts are more about the destination. To me, I'm in it for the journey. So, I hope you enjoy me taking you on this little journey. So now, let's go. I mean, let's shield. That phrase almost worked. This is my shield badge quest. Hope you enjoy. Today is December 30th, 2020. You can kind of see me in this reflection, but now you kind of can't. And a new adventure that I've been looking forward to doing since release of Sword and Shield is about to begin. My name is Matt, but you can call me Absol. You can also call me Umbrella. But unfortunately, in the Switch's symbol library, we don't have access to the Umbrella symbol. So you can call me Triangle. Yeah, I'm Triangle. Now there's a whole lot of stuff that can be done before the first badge in this game. So before I start my first hunt, we got some preparation to do. And first we need to pick a starter. Unfortunately, these starters are shiny locked and cannot be soft reset to be shiny at the beginning of the game. So we need to just pick one and move on. And the starter that I'm going to use is none other than... Grookey. And then I needed to pick my uniform number. I chose 777 because it's a lucky number and because I kind of missed the game corner. I can only imagine how incredible the game corner in the Galar region would be, where I would probably not play the slot machine at all and just buy coins. So to set up for my first hunt, I had to first attend this pep rally, where the whole football team wasn't even there, so I could get the passes to go to the DLC areas, where I'm after a very important item on the Isle of Armor, which I consider essential for my Sword and Shield shiny hunts. And that item is the reward you get for finishing the Isle of Armor Pokedex. The Mark Charm which increases your chances of finding wild Pokémon with these rare ribbons called Marks, which are exclusive to wild Pokémon in Sword and Shield. And like all ribbons in this game, when selected on the status screen, they'll give your Pokémon a special title when sent out into battle. I'm not going to go too far in depth on the rarities here, but some of these Marks are very hard to find. So, even though I'm a full odds shiny hunter, I'm not a full odds Mark hunter, and I'll do whatever I can to boost my odds of getting these things on my Pokémon. But ultimately, these marks are one of the big reasons why I'm so fascinated by random encounter hunts in Sword and Shield. You can find, like, ten of the same shiny and still be just as excited every single time because of the chance that it has a different mark than one that you previously got before. So, how did I finish the Isle of Armor decks before the first badge? Well, I made a living dex of the Isle of Armor Pokédex back whenever I made my Isle of Armor movie. And by simply transferring over those boxes from Pokemon Home to my new file on Shield, I was able to get the Mark Charm immediately right out the gate. With that, we're now pretty much set up to go do our first hunt. And I made my way to Galar Route 2, where I think I have quite a bit of explaining to do. So bear with me, we'll get to the shiny soon. So my targets on my first hunt were either the 15% Overworld Nickit or the 2% Overworld Galarian Zigzagoon. But you might notice the colors look a little bit off here. That's because I decided to go into my system settings and invert the colors on my Switch to make every Pokemon look totally different. I don't have a very good mental image in my head of how exactly colors invert, so this is going to result in finding a very unique colored shiny that's going to kind of shock me as if I were seeing the Pokémon's shiny for the very first time. I've only gotten to experience this feeling once, when I hunted Galarian Yamask on release date without looking up the shiny for it first. So I wanted to get that kind of experience again. 
by hunting in this strange inverted world. And I decided to live film this hunt instead of recording it with my capture card to show that I wasn't just using some sort of filter and was actually viewing the Switch in inverted mode. But that's not the only thing I was hunting for here. I was also looking to enter the Bingus Zone. And I understand if you might be very confused by me saying that. The Bingus Zone's the name for an interesting location glitch. One that's been observed many times on many different routes, including Route 2. Sometimes when you get into an encounter, after the encounter ends, the game might say that you're in a different location. While you're in this different location, or in the current act of bingusing, the weather, the music, and the met location of any wild Pokémon you catch will match up to the wrong location. After watching a Twitter video from Games, one of the people who discovered this glitch doing this on Route 2, I wanted to try it for myself and see how many times I could bingus over the course of this hunt. And I bingused twice. Once in the same spot that they did. My brand oh, I just did the, the bingus zone glitch. No, no way. I just walked out of it, yeah. And once in a new, previously undocumented bingus location. I bingused. And here are the higher quality, not inverted recordings of these binguses. I think this is a very fascinating glitch that still has a lot more to be discovered. Though Games and Fresgol have done a very good job of documenting every known Bingus so far, and I encourage you to check out the document and maybe look for Binguses yourself, so we can understand a little bit more about how this glitch exactly works. Anyway, without further ado, here's the shiny Galarian Zigzagoon that I eventually found on January 6, 2021, a week after starting this quest. Whoa, shiny zigzagoon! Oh my gosh! 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 Oh, that's like mint chocolate chip. That's a good consolation prize. Let me uh, get a screenshot video real quick so we can see the negative version of it. Oh man, sick. <laughs> was watching uh, Destiny Deoxys. Oh my gosh, dude. Let's see, let's get this camera all situated. I'm gonna use Premier Balls, because it would be perfect in a Premier Ball. I was ultimately hunting either this or Nickit. Um, I literally just failed a Regirock and Ruby like an hour and a half ago. So this was an excellent consolation prize, and that was really shocking to see too, because uh, <laughs> I really wasn't sure what the shiny was going to look like. I knew the white was going to be black, but I wasn't sure what color the red was going to be. So it's like a mint green. First member of the shield badge quest. That looks so sick. Pop a quick save. Wasn't really counting the number of encounters, but it looks like we're at 38 hours and 39 minutes on this file. Subtract maybe an hour for the prep that I did for this hunt. Uh, I don't know how many encounters that is, but uh, it was a good number, I guess. <laughs> let's just send this out into battle now. And then let's uh, invert our switch colors back to normal and send it out into battle. But Shiny's Galarian Zigzagoon. Sick. Display colors back to default. Sick. <laughs> 
Oh, it's so, it's so weird seeing this in its normal colors again now. That is a normal Nicket. Despite it not being blue like all the Nicket that I've seen on this hunt. And shiny Galarian Zigzagoon. Oh my gosh. Great first member of the team, I gotta say. One of the best shinies of this new generation, if you ask me. I know, yeah, I forgot to check to see uh, nature and if it has a mark. So I'm going to guess mild. Don't really have any guesses right now. Um, it's not mild. It's neutral. Quirky. And it has a mark. It's the lunchtime mark. <laughs> Zigzagoon the peckish. It's definitely not lunchtime right now, even on my Switch. It's 10.08. But I guess since you're, when you're playing through the story, these uh, areas are set to a certain time of day. This is forced um, midday, so you'll always get lunchtime mark Pokemon. That's pretty interesting. But sick, we started off with a mark shiny right off the bat. So it was actually super worth it to um, go and collect that mark charm. Zigzagoon the Peckish. She'll be named Andy's Mint. Before moving on to the next badge and my next hunt, I decided to take another little bit of a glitch hunting detour. Attempting to recreate an interesting glitch where you can ride your bike before even having a bike. Due to your character very briefly clipping through this bridge and making the game think that you're standing on water, forcing you onto the water bike which you don't own yet, putting you back on land and putting you back on your bicycle. But I was never able to get it to work from this particular location. But what got me to really take this bicycle detour in the first place was a tweet that I had received. Shiny Hunter Tate was able to access this early bike glitch on the Isle of Armor at Challenge Beach. And I was interested to investigate this, and to see if I could really go out onto the water here from the beach, and do a little bit of a sequence break shiny hunt. And by running at just the right angle, I was at least successful in getting on the bike. But I was never successful in actually going out onto the water. And this bike's not actually very useful for shiny hunting because the second you get into a random encounter, the game recognizes you don't have a bike and boots you off of it, making you have to recreate the glitch in order to get on the bike again. But being on the Isle of Armor inspired me to start my second hunt. In fact, I forgot to even go get my first badge before I started my second hunt of this badge quest. My next target, which I didn't start hunting till the end of February, was Galarian Slowpoke. Which is a very nice and relaxed shiny hunt along the beach of the Fields of Honor on the Isle of Armor. Since Slowpoke is the only thing that regularly spawns along the beach. I actually intended to hunt this one on my capture card and didn't really have a quirky reason to live film it instead. But in the heat of the moment, the Crown Tundra movie was rendering on my laptop, and I feel like my computer would explode if I were recording with my capture card at the same time. So I ended up getting this one on camera as well. And it only took a day to find. Shiny Slowpoke! Oh my gosh, dude! Shiny Slowpoke! Oh my gosh, dude! Yeah! Shiny Galarian Slowpoke! Yeah, I'm gonna pause real quick. I am on the jankiest live filming setup in the world right now because I've got literally the Crown Tundra movie rendering right here right now while I'm chatting with my friend Davis watching the latest ReZero episode. What a time to find a shiny slowpoke. The power of Anime Night is way too strong, man. This had to have been like after maybe like 400, 500 encounters. I was counting last night while I was also watching Attack on Titan with my friend Eeb. Got to like 380 or so. Started watching this ReZero episode tonight, wasn't counting, really wasn't expecting anything to happen, and of course, when you expect nothing to happen, that's when the shiny appears. <laughs> and there we go, Slowpoke, thank you. So, th so this counts for badge two, we'll just say it does. Regular Galarian Slowpoke. Shiny Galarian Slowpoke. Sick. Oh dude, I gotta check to see if it has a mark real quick. And it does! The sleepy time mark, so it's Slowpoke the Sleepy. Perfect. February 28th. I got my Slowpoke yesterday, and now I'm putting it in my Pokemon home. Because I want to evolve this thing into Galarian Slowking. Because my current badge quest file isn't far enough in the game to have access to the crown that you get to evolve it into Galarian Slowking. So I transferred it to another file to get that done. Then I think we're going to do something pretty cool. 
So yesterday when I got it, I was live filming Pokemon Battle Revolution on this TV, and I thought to myself, how cool would it be if I could play Switch on this, even though it doesn't have an HDMI input? And then I realized there are definitely HDMI to RCA adapters out there. So let's hook up this Switch to the TV. So this is the setup I got going here. Here's the adapter itself. The Switch's HDMI plugs in here, like so. So let's turn on the TV and see what the Switch looks like on this old CRT. First time ever seeing this. This is my first time powering it on. I'm not sure what's gonna happen. Oh, and there we go. It's pretty bright, but uh, that is definitely my Nintendo Switch. It's all kind of squished together because it's uh, widescreen, but this is undoubtedly Pokemon, man. So let's fly down here. Three point pass. Let's go um, get what we need for our slow king. Here's the lady. Give her the twigs. Galerica Wreath. Now, let's evolve Slowpoke into Slowking. Sick. Look at the squad, man. This is such a good team already. And we still have four team members to find, plus some. So to keep things going and collect more members of my team, I had my first gym battle with Milo. So uh, in the meantime, here's a fun fact. Joltik actually has a branched evolution. If you attach a Joltik to the gym leader Milo, it will evolve into Milotic. Feel free to unsubscribe and dislike the video right now. After getting the first badge, which I really should have had at this point, I made an immediate beeline to go get the second badge so I could start my third hunt. Ooh, Zigzagoon's evolving. Let's go, dude. Linoon. So with my new Linoon, I fought Nessa. And in this moment, I decided I would solo each gym leader with each of my shinies that I collect along the badge quest. So I could also show them off in their Dynamax forms in each individual gym stadium. But after getting the second badge, I decided to take on the weirdest and glitchiest hunt of this whole badge quest. This is gonna be a doozy. So you're probably familiar with the Void Glitch in Diamond and Pearl, where by doing some specific bicycle movements, you can effectively travel out of bounds and go wherever your heart desires. Well, in Sword and Shield, the power of the bicycle did it again. And there is once again a Void Glitch. Though the possibilities aren't as nearly infinite as they are in Diamond and Pearl. But one of the things we can do with it is Shiny Hunt out of bounds at the Modestoke outskirts before I'm even allowed to normally be there in the story. Yem has a very good video tutorial on how to do this, and I highly recommend you check out her video if you want more information on this. But I'll go through the steps that I took in a rough way here, too. Starting out with going to this tree on Route 3. First, make sure that you're on your bike, then start shaking this tree until you get a wild Pokémon encounter. Once you exit the encounter and pick all the berries, you're going to want to hold a direction on the control stick so that you clip into the tree. And then position yourself like so, so you're facing south. And then while you're inside this tree, you're going to want to go to your YCOM, and then either join an online raid or host one yourself on another Switch like I did. Once you click start a challenge and are waiting in the lobby for the raid, you're going to want to press the home button on your Switch and go to your system settings. Then on the calendar, Change to a day forward from whatever day it currently is. Load up your game again and exit the raid lobby, and you'll notice that the berries grew back on the tree. Then the idea is to shake the tree once more, and to exit out once you get your first group of berries. After that, you're going to want to try and tap up to see if you can actually clip out of bounds. We're out of bounds, baby! <laughs> Look at me just poking my head through there! <laughs> this is crazy, man. Hello, trees. I'm one with the trees. Hi. Why, why have I waited a year to try this glitch? This is incredible. Then you're going to want to go to the slope right here and slowly start to ascend on your bike. 
We're going higher! <laughs> Once you've ascended a little bit, hop off the bike and walk south to the boundary of the area. Then we're going to hop back on our bike again and then tap down to slowly ascend the wall here. This slow climb takes a little bit, but the view is very very nice, especially at sunset. I've always wondered if that factory off in the distance there was something that we were meant to originally go to at some point in the game's development cycle, or if it would always just be a permanent background prop just something to be briefly mentioned by Sonya in passing as we walk past her. There's also a Corvusquire right in front of the fence there, and it's shiny locked for whatever reason. Which is very very strange and one of the only instances of a strong spawn being shiny locked in this game. But anyway, you just sat through me climbing the wall. I did it! I think I climbed the wall! Whoa, this is crazy! I'm so high up right now. And now, we've ascended, and we can access pretty much any area between Route 3 and the Motostoke outskirts from Out of Bounds. Which is a lot more limited than the entire Sinnoh region plus some in Diamond and Pearl. But is still insanely cool and can lead to some pretty interesting exploration if you take your time here. But I didn't really dilly-dally too much in the void here. I had a specific location where I wanted to go. So, if we head towards the Motostoke outskirts and get close enough to it, We'll take a major drop from the sky, but we'll be alright, we'll, we'll land safely, no worries, no fall damage in this game. And we can start my shiny hunt. We're about to go on a big drop. Oh my gosh, that was, that was scary. But now we're here. Out of bounds. And here, out of bounds, we can begin our next shiny hunt. I'm gonna save, or I can't actually save here, that's great. And due to the way that most Pokémon respond to our whistling, we can only encounter a select few Pokémon on this route from outside the fence here. Oh, there's a there's a sock. I mean a throw. Throw will run at us for sure. So the Pokémon you can encounter are Throw, or Sock if you're playing Sword, Salandit, which can only be found here in Shield for some reason despite it not being version exclusive, and the exclamation mark encounters on the route. There we go, there's an encounter! <laughs> This is certainly going to be an interesting shiny hunt if I commit to it. But you don't have to commit to doing this out of bounds like I did. You can also position yourself so you drop down from the wall within the Motostoke outskirts, but that's just not as interesting to me on this sort of hunt. Despite being able to do this so early on, this doesn't really introduce any sort of major sequence break to the game's story events, because of the linearity of this game's event flags. But it's still really cool nonetheless to be in an area sort of before you're supposed to be and to be able to hunt from outside the fence like this. Before I even really got to take much time to really explore this hunt, the hunt was over before I knew it. Here are the moments leading up to this very quickly found Out of Bounds shiny on March 1st. Yeah. Shiny throw! What? <laughs> Very fast hunt. I didn't even realize it was shiny for a second. I was doing an early screening of the Crown Tundra movie with some friends during this, so I didn't really say much during the capture. But I was mostly just dumbfounded that this hunt went by so quickly, while I was basically still doing test encounters for it. I want to say that this was just over 100 encounters, but I didn't even have my counter on screen on the layout while I was capturing this thing. So now I needed to escape from out of bounds, but first I decided to camp out here one more time before leaving. When I got into camp, Throw seemed a little bit concerned. It seemed a little bit worried about its surroundings, but there was really no need to worry whatsoever. All I needed to do to escape the void was to just fly on a Corviknight taxi. And then I could save the game and continue on with the story, up to the third badge. But. We're not going to get the third badge yet. 
We're gonna hunt our fourth shiny before we obtain our third badge. And here's why. So the gym mission for the Motostoke Gym is pretty unique. It involves capturing wild Pokémon alongside trainers that are trying to sabotage your capture. And by some miracle, these wild Pokémon are not shiny locked and can be shiny hunted. So obviously, that's gotta be the next member of our badge quest. You have the choice between Sizzlipede, Litwick, or Vulpix here. And in order to hunt them, you can just do simple runaways. Once you run away from one of these three Pokémon, it'll be unavailable until you encounter one of the other two. So you can either encounter all three, or just stick to the two that you want most. Personally, I wanted Sizzlipede most, and alternated mostly between Sizzlipede and Litwick. But there's another unique aspect of this hunt. And that unique thing is that these encounters favor Star Sparkles over Square Sparkles, unlike most other wild encounters in the game. So now let me take an opportunity to take a couple steps back, and talk about shiny sparkles in general in Sword and Shield, because there's still so much misinformation and confusion out there about them. To make a long story short, there are two types of shiny sparkles in Sword and Shield. Star sparkles and square sparkles. And the way these are determined are part of the Pokémon generating process. And within Sword and Shield, Pokémon are generated in a lot of different ways. So going from encounter method to encounter method, your odds of finding these sparkles kind of varies depending on how the Pokémon's generated in the first place. So, the following here tend to favor star sparkles. With a 15 out of 16 chance of the shiny having star sparkles, and a 1 in 16 chance of the shiny having square sparkles. On the inverse of that, these are encounters that tend to favor... What do I do with my hand? These are encounters that tend to favor having square sparkles, with an incredibly rare chance of having star sparkles. Finding a star shiny one of these ways is something to write home about. I've only ever seen it happen to someone once before personally, it might have happened to more people out there, and it's absolutely insane when that happens. On top of that, the shiny sparkles can be forced in a way too. Like in Dynamax Adventures, it's always stars, and through other means, there are some shinies that are always four square. So I hope this clears up a little bit of the confusion, there are technical reasons behind this, but I'm sure some of y'all's heads are already spinning from me talking about Bingus Zones earlier, so I'll save y'all that for right now. Here's the shiny that I found in the Motostoke Gym. <laughs> it was so well animated. <laughs> is that a shiny sizzle pee? It is! In the gym! No way! That was a fast hunt! That was 350 encounters! I noticed that! Watching Jujutsu Kaisen with my friend RJ. Let's knock out this Salandit so we can catch the Sizzlipede. So sick! The power of Anime Night, really. Oh man. Fourth part of the badge quest, even though it's in the third gym. Easy premiere ball catch. Let's go. Alright, my friend RJ who was watching uh, Jujutsu Kaisen with in the call guesses Hasty. And this thing is naughty. It's a naughty little bug. In the third gym. I'm gonna save right now. Nice. Now another unique thing about the battles within this gym is that you can prolong the shiny sparkles on the Pokemon you send out indefinitely until you press the A button right here. So you can build up a lot of suspense leading to the sparkle, like I did here while I was checking my phone. Look at that comparison. 
Now hear me out on this, this is going to sound really weird, but from the first time I ever saw Sizzlipede, the only thing I could think about when I saw its flat body and stature was the shredded chicken quesadilla melt from Taco Bell, which was maybe my favorite food menu item ever from there, and honestly rivaled Baja Blast and the reason why I would go there in the first place. This menu item is now discontinued, but I had to name the Sizzlipede after it as tribute, so its name is Shredded Chicken. But anyway, it's time to actually take on Kabu now, with just our throw, which I went back and nicknamed OOB, which stands for Out of Bounds. Or whatever you want OOB to stand for, right? You can, you can take a creative route with it if you want. Oklahoma Oyster Bowling. Or maybe you could stand for like, Okemon. Oh boy. He's also definitely an orange obedient boy. Oh, our battle is over. And so is me suggesting these OOB names, completely out of box like that. So, as we just saw in that last battle with Kabu, Sizzlipede's evolution Scorch, is capable of Gigantamaxing. And in order to make my Scorch Gigantamax, I have to go to the Isle of Armor and feed it some Max Soup. And on my way to the fourth gym, I also had another really cool evolution happen. And now my team was looking a lot more grown up and menacing. But we're about to battle a gym leader who's not grown up and is still menacing. Alistair. And here I was able to use the super menacing shiny Gigantamax Centiscorch. Which is really really menacing because it looks almost no different from the non-shiny normal Gigantamax Centiscorch. Its little tiny legs are actually a slightly darker shade of blue, but it's really, really hard to tell from most camera angles in the game, and it looks no different normally. <laughs> and now with Alistair defeated, it's time to move on to our next badge, and a shiny hunt that's a lot more conventional than the past few. March 23rd, 2021. On rainy days like these, humans were made to play video games. That may or may not be a true statement. But uh, right now for the next part of the badge quest, I'm here at the wild area with these two bros right here. And we're about to farm some fossils from these bros. So this skill guy right here, he's the one who's gonna give us our fossils. We gotta get as many dinos and fish as we possibly can. So I continuously farmed for these fossils, which was mostly just mashing the A button over and over again. There are four types of fossils in Sword and Shield. Bird, Dino, Drake, and Fish. Dino and Fish combine to create Arctivish, which is my target. Dino is hard to find in Shield and easier to find in Sword, while Fish is easier to find in Shield and harder to find in Sword. Drake and Bird have a similar dynamic. For a little bit of perspective, I found 16 fossilized fish before I found my first Dino. But getting all the watts that you need to do all this digging is really no issue if you have the Isle of Armor DLC and Armorite Ore, because of just how many watts you get from just a single session with Digging Paw. I spent a good bit of time setting this up on two files. Two games, ready to go. This hunt actually took me a while compared to all the other hunts, even though it was the first one where I started double hunting, because this was probably the first hunt on this badge quest that went over odds. This was also the first hunt of this badge quest that I actually streamed and didn't keep a secret from most people. For the sake of the Arctivish, and any Arctivish who may have been watching the stream, I decided to flip the screens upside down to make it so they could breathe a little bit more easily since their heads are on upside down. And it took me over 4,000 encounters for someone in the chat to come in and say, hey, you're doing this hunt slower than someone in the Stone Age would. And that's because I had sound effects turned on. Whenever you do these fossil revives, there's a pretty long revive sound effect that you have to go through every single time, and if you turn off sound effects, you get to skip that entirely. On April 16th, after a couple weeks of hunting, both online and offline, I found this shiny offline. And here's my encounter with it. Shiny Arctivish! 
Yo! That was quick, man. Power of Anime Night strikes again. That was after I have to turn my head upside down. 6495 revived. Probably a little bit more than that. But it's it's on the badge quest file, man. That stood out so much. That looks so good. That's sick. And it's upside down on the layout, too. Then, with the super stark contrast between my super old fossil fish and this young lass we battled for our next gym leader battle, I took on Opal with just my Arctivish, which I named Snessy. Well, actually, I didn't name it that. Tales of Taylor or Poketot actually named it that, but I really liked it because this color scheme really evokes the SNES imagery pretty well. Today's April 20th, back when I opened some Shiny Star V, I got all kinds of code cards. And I'm about to go online to some Japanese website and use them because they expire at the end of this month. Now I'm on this Japanese website right here. Got it going through Google Translate right now. We gotta read these terms and conditions very carefully. Yeah, I think I read them pretty well. Now we fill out this survey. Age, I'm two years old. Male, all caps woman. Let's just say Tokyo, let's be really general here. I like to look at Twitter. How fascinating I was! <laughs> I hope answering that I was two years old did not um, lock us out of this. All right, now we gotta redeem codes to get some stuff for the stamp rally. Get, 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 get. Okay, this is the one that I'm really interested in, the Safari and uh, Sport Ball. So they are on the back of this, or I guess the front of it, now that I have it flipped. Let's type these babes in. Genesect. Balls. More balls. Marshall. And the Master Ball. And now with this haul of cool things from this survey on our file, we could begin the sixth hunt, which would not take place on the capture card like how I started it out. Instead, it would have a pretty unique twist on it, in a place where I don't know if any sword and shield hunt has ever gone before. In 2020, I ordered this magnificent device. The largest Game Boy cartridge that I own. Let me slide in my Rebecca Bass Special Edition SP. See, Rebecca Bass. This is a Game Boy Advance TV tuner. And back in the day, had this magnificent antenna that you could both use to uh, win in all sorts of fencing duels and pick up signals. But these days, it's most useful for its AV input. Actually, that's where you plug in the power. The AV input, where you can plug in a game console. And thanks to the RCA adapter that I got earlier for the Switch, we can play Switch games on the Game Boy SP. Of course, we can't really control anything on the SP, but we can use it as a TV. And the only drawbacks of this are the resolution. I can't really read a single word of what's going on on screen here. And just the absolute monstrous power draw that this thing does to the poor Game Boy SP. But using that Game Boy SP as a TV, I decided to hunt for either more Peko or Thievil on Route 7. I did stream a little bit of this hunt, and I was very excited to show people how you change the contrast on this. Look at this. Contract. Contract. I don't think that's the right word. Hugh? But once again, I ended up getting the shiny offline. And I went on a little break from hunting for a month or two before I got it, so I could do some wonder trading or something dumb like that. Here's the shiny that I found. A little fun sized forge. Ah, uh, yeah, you just can't. But like, even if you, if it's like super, super broken beyond belief, it doesn't really result in too bad of an item still.
be over in seconds, dude. Shiny, shiny Thievil, dude. Yeah, on the Game Boy SP. Seconds, dude. Shiny, shiny Thievil, dude. Yeah. And I unfortunately made a sad mistake during the capture. I wanted to use my new Safari Ball to catch this thing, but I accidentally threw a Pokeball first turn. And when I sent out my Yamper before sending out the Safari Ball in order to attempt the Ball Fetch, Ball Fetch activated and fetched my Pokeball instead. So I couldn't catch it in the Safari Ball without the risk of losing it. You can get like multiple items and stuff too through it. Oh, that just wasted my Ball Fetch. No, I, I, I'm still good. I, I just sent out my Yamper trying to catch it with the Safari Ball, but it fetched the Pokeball that I'd thrown in the past. And we catched it in a Pokeball, which is probably the most boring ball to catch it in. But when I'm looking at this on a Game Boy SP, just successfully catching it in general is um, good enough. <laughs> cool Silver Fox right there, man. Okay, I can kind of see the keyboard. I'm just naming it SP. Was chatting it up with my friend E, Bucci Boy, watching season two of Attack on Titan. Oh, let me see if it has a mark. No mark. I've put myself up to a very difficult task. And that task is trying to solve the gym puzzle of the sixth gym on this tiny little screen. I'm managing though. Made it through the second area. Look at that. I have no idea what she's saying right now. After I navigated through the ice maze, I took on the gym leader Melanie with just my Thievil on the Game Boy SP. My main strategy here was to use Fire Fang, which was a move that I went and taught my Thievil before this battle because I knew it would need it. And this actually proved to be a pretty lengthy and difficult battle because Thievil's stats just are not that great. But, I made it through the battle on my tiny little SP screen just fine. And then, I needed to think about what I was going to hunt next. Alright, time for a think about the next hunt road trip. Well, I'm back home on this pier found some sort of garlic spray. And I found where the real party's at here. Look at this. We got Mountain Dew. Got some ranch, ranch it up. Dip the Mountain Dew in that. A um, little bit of uh, orange crush to mix with it. Looks like an incredible day out on the lake. The world gave me all sorts of hunt ideas on my trip back home. Like Pelipper, Trubbish, Braviary, Lopany, maybe Vespaquin, Rock Ruff. Maybe even Galarian Rapidash. But many of these were shinies I already have. And what else remained from the footage that I got on this trip was a lot of footage of water. And I think that actually points to where I wanted to hunt next. Since after you get the 7th badge, you get actual access to the water bike. Allowing you to go out and surf for all sorts of various things. So it was decided. I would get the water bike, and I would hunt for a pretty unique Pokemon out on the water. And I'd revisit a certain little bike glitch just for fun first. The interesting bike glitch that I was talking about earlier can actually happen here, right along the ledge in Turfield. And I attempted it many times before receiving the water bike to see if I could go out onto the water. But I never had any luck attempting to do a cheeky pre-water bike water biking session. So I went out and I actually got the water bike, and I still decided to glitch out onto the water here to start this hunt. Now here in Turfield, there's only one wild Pokémon you can encounter. A lone Crawdont that only spawns in once. So per save file, you only have one opportunity to catch this thing and then you can never catch a Pokemon in Turfield ever again. This thing works like a strong spawn, so I need to save outside of the range of it being spawned in, which is a little bit right here, and soft reset for it this way, running up on it every single time. 
And continuing the insane luck that I've had on this badge quest, I managed to find this shiny the same day that I started the hunt. Only an hour or two after starting it. On July 5th, 2021. Shiny Crawdon! Yo! Yes! Oh my gosh, dude! Oh, what? Only 134? Next part of the badge quest coming in hot. Don't eat my dog. All right, let's try this out. Sport ball. If I catch it, I catch it. Got it. Nice. Sport ball crawled on. And just one day of hunting. The town menace has been locked away. And you're staying a yamper, buddy. Puppy. Look at this thing. She's been uh, terrorizing this town of Turfield for a while. Uh, messing around with their water supply. I'm just going to name her Buster. You're not going anywhere, Buster. Let's see if she has a mark. She does! The lunchtime mark. <laughs> Buster the peckish. She was just hungry. Let's see if we can uh, feed her something on this on this journey. I can't believe I did that in just one night. Yet another phase of this badge quest that went by ridiculously fast. Only 134 resets. I didn't even have time to change the layout. This is the layout that I had for my previous phase before um, I decided to hunt it on the SP. So when I was a kid, I always thought Crawdon's mouth was like the, the stripe and not the actual thing above. Crazy. She was peckish, so let's let's feed her lunch real quick. Normal Wulu. Shiny Crawdon. And a sport ball with a mark. After taking on the pizza party at the pier in real life, we took on piers in game. With just my Crawdon. This was a dark type versus dark type battle. And since Pokemon can't Dynamax in Piers' gym, we won't see Dynamax Crawdon here, but we can just imagine it. I, I bet it looks pretty big. So now we have seven badges. Meaning we can catch Pokemon up to level 55. However, the final hunt that I want to do requires me to catch a Pokemon that's above level 60. So in a very fitting fashion for the Pokemon that I will be hunting last, we're going to get our next badge with a phony, or not even the shiny of the Pokemon I'm actually going to be going for. And I'm going to do the hunt for this Pokemon after I get this badge. So let's get this eighth badge with a good old phony right here. So, while I'm taking on the 8th gym here, let's talk about this hunt for the antique Sinistee I'm about to do. Sinistee is a Pokémon with maybe one of the most subtle form differences in the entire series. A phony and antique form differentiated only by a small stamp on its underside that's only visible during certain animations. While it doesn't have much wow factor to it on looks alone, the actual background behind this hunt itself truly makes it a holy grail of a shiny hunt since, you know, it's literally a cup. So first of all, Antique Sinisty does not pass down the stamp in breeding, so you have to find it in the wild. In the base game of Sword and Shield, there was only one place you could go to do this, the Glimwood Tangle. A place with no overworld encounters, so you have to rely on the truly random exclamation mark encounters in order to find it, where Sinisty appears 11% of the time, 10% phony, and 1% antique in a separate encounter slot. Hunting for this thing in the wild here is a completely random 1% shiny hunt, and some people have persevered over these past two years and actually achieved it, while others are still attempting it. But there did exist one way to make it appear a little bit more frequently, making curry in Pokemon Camp. Since making curry in Pokemon Camp seems to favor Pokemon on the rarer end of the encounter tables. But going the curry route's a little bit extreme. And it's definitely a kind of shiny hunt that I want to attempt one day, but just not now during this badge quest. And then that brings us to the DLC. 
namely the Crown Tundra, where the old cemetery area has Sinistee appearing as an overworld spawn, where you can hunt it by just encountering the Sinistee. But there's a higher ratio of phony Sinistee to antique Sinistee here. 19 or 20% to 1%. But we can still make things work out in our favor. That's where the T-Smash technique by Shiny Hunter and Researcher Anubis comes in. This technique makes use of an interesting mechanic that was mentioned on the Pokemon website, but I still feel like most people don't know about. When you encounter an overworld wild Pokemon, as in one that has its 3D model there, not an exclamation mark encounter, if you knock out the Pokemon, don't catch it or run from it, there's a 50% chance the next Pokemon that spawns in will be from the same encounter slot. And since we mentioned earlier that Antique Sinistee has its own encounter slot, this mechanic can apply to that as well. We're going to combine this with a mechanic that may sound counterintuitive to shiny hunting at first. And that is saving in front of a wild Pokemon that's already spawned in on the overworld. This is usually a big no-no because everything about the encounter down to shininess is already predetermined. So if you soft reset and continuously reset the game, encountering this Pokemon, you're just seeing the same Pokemon over and over. But, this is actually perfect for trying to get an antique Sinistee and setting up this T-Smash method. The idea is to save in front of every Sinistee you see in the old cemetery, do a test capture, check to see if it's authentic. There's an authentic, or an antique. And regardless of the outcome, reset the game without saving to be saved in front of that Sinistee again. If it was authentic, congratulations, you're all set up for this hunt, and ready to begin the smashing portion of it. But if it's not, just move on to another Sinistee in the overworld and rinse and repeat the process until you find an authentic one. But anyway, the idea is, every reset of the hunt, you start out by knocking out this guaranteed antique Sinistee that you're saved in front of. And then you encounter every Sinistee that appears after that, knocking each one of those out, seeing if you get that encounter bonus. Also, be wary that getting exclamation mark encounters can mess up getting these bonus encounters. So it's recommended you use repels, which I personally had never used in Sword and Shield until this point. So basically, it's just a soft reset hunt, where you keep knocking out your target until your target no longer appears, in which case you reset the game. Also, you always tack on that first encounter, which will always be the same Pokémon and never be shiny, and you're not always guaranteed to get an encounter with your target every reset. But 50% compared to 1%, not bad odds in my eyes. This proved to be a both fun and time-consuming hunt that I ended up streaming a whole lot of, and in order to get through it, I needed to have some special fuel. About to try the forbidden mixture. A little bit of punch. A little bit of blast. A little bit of flash. And now, can't even tell what color this mixture is. But we've created something either beautiful or terrible. Time to try it. Yeah, that's not very good. It, it's, a, it's a bad mixture. Does not all go together. Months passed by, and so did negative millions of encounters, somehow. And over the course of this hunt, the seasonal Mountain Dew flavors even shifted. Baja stuff has left the store shelves, and this new Dew is Voodoo. I don't know what the mystery flavor is this year, so I'm gonna put it in this authentic Pokemon cup and hope to maybe summon this authentic Sinistee with this instead. That's really good. This tastes like fruit by the foot. And over the course of this hunt, I got to experience many different things. Like the reveal of the final Smash Fighter, who I was clearly not very enthusiastic about. No, it is Sora! <laughs> it's Sora! Let's go, dude! No way. October 15th. Got another thing to react to instead of the shiny Sinistee. Marlo. Jabwick, dude! They Dude, they brought back that guy! <laughs> no way, dude! They brought back one of the GameCube guys! Then, on stream on October 19th, with probably one of the cleanest layouts ever seen on Twitch.tv, this happened. 
there's some strange interconnectivity going on that really wasn't explored all that much in Sword and Shield, but was really heavily explored in the Alola games and was being built up in the games prior to it. And I wouldn't be shocked if uh, Legends <gasps> built it. Oh my gosh, Shiny Sinisty! Oh my gosh, Shiny Sinisty! Oh my gosh! Yes! German Naruto is just about to start playing. Oh my gosh, it's here. Hold on. We, we gotta see if this is uh, authentic or not. I'm gonna hide this, this poll right here. Ignore what the poll says. Uh, it looks like How and Opal going to market for a Chex Mix. Their days are numbered. Okay. I got Taunt selected here. We're gonna taunt this thing to make sure it doesn't use Memento. I'll do. I'll go ahead and do that actually. And now we have to see if it's authentic or not. And, and look, it tried to use Memento first turn there. Oh my gosh. Okay, I have the Master Ball highlighted, just in case. If this is authentic, I will use the Master Ball actually. Oh my gosh, eight thousand two hundred thirty-four encounters. On the badge quest file, too, I might need to point out, this is the actual file I've been using for this badge quest. If this is not authentic, I'm still going to continue the badge quest with this phony one and come back and do another phase of this hunt. But in this moment, we're about to find out if this is the only phase, and it appears to be phony. <laughs> I'm just going to toss an Ultra Ball. Actually, no, I'll use Dusk Balls. Dusk Ball would look fine with this thing. The ball itself doesn't look great, but the Dusk Ball effect with Sinistee coming out is nice. And we caught it. First ball. I'll go for the next phase of this hunt uh, after I finish um, the Badge Quest movie and stuff. So I had a name. I have a name in mind for the, the authentic one when I get it. Uh, but for right now, I'll go with the original name I had for it, which really isn't much of a T-pun. I'm going to go with Baja Punch. There we go. It looks like I have 94 hours of playtime on this save, but really, I am at 280. Um, let's check to see if it has a mark, and let's look at what nature it is. Lots of nature guesses in the chat right now. Looks like it is plus speed, minus defense. Is that hasty? Yeah, it's hasty. And it's got a mark. Stormy mark. Baja Punch the Thunderstruck. That is a cool mark right there. I don't think I've ever had a Thunderstruck Pokemon before. Come and get me, buddy. And it's not shiny. Normal Dragapult. Baja Punch. Beautiful. My Sinistee may not be the authentic target that I was hoping for, but it's still beautiful, and it's still a shiny. And it has a mark, which is also pretty sick. So I'll keep pressing on with it. And I think this opens up the opportunity for a better narrative outside of this movie. My return to this hunt, to one day hunt for the antique Sinistee again, and see if I can get that special stamp on the bottom perhaps underneath another incredible full moon. But who knows when that will be? Probably many moons from now. One day, I'll probably pick up where I left off on this cup. But for now, we got some gaming to do. So let's game through the rest of the game. It's such a dumb sounding sentence. And let me introduce you to the final team I've decided on. I've decided that the final team here will be all of the Pokemon that were new to this generation that I got. So we're leaving Throw and Crawdont behind in the PC. But this will be the final team I take the, the Elite Four on with. Wait, there is no Elite Four in this game. How does a teacup hold a ball? Okay, in the teacup. That was a stupid question. Now it's all drenched in tea though. Ew, the ball's all, all wet with ghost tea. Poltygeist in the house. Sipping on the Baja Blast. Or the Baja Punch. Really, it's the Baja Punch here. 
Regular sand shroom. Drinking from the mug. Baja punched the thunderstruck. We've done it. We've brought them together at last. Finally. They can share the tea time. They've been waiting for like 8,000 encounters for. Cheers. And with Sinistee evolved into Poltegeist, all that was left to do was play through the rest of the game. Leading up to our final battle versus the champion, Leon. And while we're taking on this final battle, I might as well go on my little monologue and sign off here. It's been a very, very fun time spending most of 2021 doing this badge quest. Uh, it's given me another fun reason to play through Sword and Shield, and I could honestly see myself doing something like this again. And this has been my fourth movie about Sword and Shield too, which is absolutely crazy. I didn't expect to make that many movies about one game. But I'm very happy to be able to finish this before the release of Brilliant Diamond, Shining Pearl, and Legends Arceus. And if I was able to make four movies about this game, surely I'll be able to make at least a few movies about those too. So, on top of my regular kind of uploads where I might shiny hunt here and there, do level 100 gauntlets, occasionally open up some cards and stuff, always expect one of these longer movie projects. And if it seems like I'm away for a longish period of time, don't worry. I'm most likely probably just working on one of these big projects in secret, because that's just kind of the way that I like to operate. But if you've sat through all of this so far, really, really appreciate you for uh, watching this, and I hope you had as much fun as I did, and maybe learn something new about shiny hunting and sword and shield. But anyway, as always, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Badge quest is complete. And here we go. The final scene. The badge quest complete. Look at those shinies.